and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we get all the Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games from January 1987. I play with the Cheetah Sound Sampler. I review some older games, play a newer title, Jeff has another hidden gem. Jason completes his Berserk clone. And I end with some serious software. But first, the news. It seems that some versions of the recently released game Gauntlet by US Gold will not load on the newer Plus 2 machines. US Gold informed users to be careful when buying the game because there are two versions currently in circulation. The ones with the black coloured inlay will not work on the Plus 2, or may have Kempston joystick problems. You will need to make sure, if you've got a Plus 2 machine, that you buy the one with the buff coloured inlay, if you want the game to work. With the availability of mice for the Spectrum, it was just a matter of time before someone came up with a front end that allows the same functionality as the more modern Macintosh machines. Advanced memory systems have released such a beast, named Max Desktop, that works with the AMX mouse, and quite impressive it looks too. Designed to work with the microdrives, there are several now familiar features including a trash can, notepad and settings. Mastertronic are to launch a new label to fill the gap in its current lineup. The new label, called Bulldog, will be for action games that require a little more thought than the average all-out fast-paced action. They coped Spellbound as a typical example, but say they are aiming for more action than this title offers. The games will sell for $1.99, with the first title being Feud, released at the end of the month. Staying with Mastertronic, and they are still unhappy with the way the software charts are being handled. If you recall a few months back, Gallup decided to include WH Smith in their sales counts, but Mastertronic titles were not available there, thereby, according to the budget label, skewing the results. W8 Smith then agreed to stock the games, but still Mastertronic are unhappy, and are now considering legal action. They claim that according to the charts, Mastertronic held 10.5% share of the games sold over December, but they are adamant that they have at least double that figure. The major problem is the limited outlets that Gallup use to calculate their weekly and monthly charts. Because they use W8 Smith and Menzies, that leaves out some other stores such as Boots, Woolworths and Toys R Us. Staying with Boots for a while, and the argument between them and Amstrad is still running on. After Amstrad fixed the tape alignment problems, Boots have begun to stock the Plus 2 machines again. However, they are still complaining about Amstrad's decision to make the joystick ports non-standard. Instead of sticking with the now familiar Kempston format, Amstrad have modified the ports to work only with Amstrad joysticks. Boots are trying to put pressure on them to reconsider the situation. And that was the news. And now on to the top selling games. Riding high in the charts this month are Iridium, the smooth scrolling shooter from Houston, Heavy on the Magic, a graphic adventure from Gargoyle Games, The Boggit, a Mickey taking adventure from CRL, Firelord, a graphically impressive game from Houston again, and Kai Temple. Kung Fu Capers from Firebird. And that was the news and top selling games from January 1987. In a previous episode, I looked at EasySpeak, a software sound sampler. This episode, I will review the Cheetah sound sampler, obviously the hardware equivalent that in theory will produce much higher quality results. The box depicts various sound sources that the device can be used to capture, and inside we get software, a microphone, and the interface itself. The interface is about the same size as a joystick adapter. It has two rotary knobs on the front, a lead that connects to something that you can use to amplify the sound, and an input socket for the microphone. Setting it up is easy, you just connect it to your spectrum, plug in the microphone, plug the output lead into something that can amplify it, in my case I connected it to the input on my television. 
once the software has loaded, you get a nice simple menu that gives you the options to sample a sound, edit a sample, play back samples, and select a RAM bank. This last one is only used for 1 to 8K machines, when you can have multiple banks to store your samples in. Making a new sample is easy. You select Sample a Sound from the main menu, you can set the trigger to Automatic or Manual, and I found the Manual option to be slightly easy to use. You're then told how many units are free. This equates to the amount of RAM that can be used for each sample. When you start you get about 116, and this should give you about 4 seconds worth of sound on the best quality setting. You input a name for the sample, select half or full speed, and you're ready to go. Press the space and start to talk. Hello and welcome! To hear your wonderful creation, the easiest way is to press 3 and list the samples. This will play any samples you already have in memory. Hello and welcome. The sound quality is not actually bad. It's a little quiet on my television, even though it was on full volume. You can now edit the sample, and you have to do this if you want to play it back using the built-in piano, which we'll see shortly. In the editor you have to set four points. The start point, the beginning of the loop, the end of the loop, and the end of the sample. To do this you press F and B to move forwards and backwards through the sample on screen, and use 1, 2, 3 and 4 keys to set the aforementioned points. Once you've done this you can then use the piano. From the main menu select 3, type in the name of the sample you want to use, Select whether you want to use sustain or not, I heard no difference either way, and then you get the piano. Here you can play all the different notes, using the space key to move up an octave. It's all very 80s pop culture. Taking the samples onto my PC and ramping up the volume will give you some idea of the quality you can get from this device when using the microphone. Hello and welcome, 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 welcome. Hello and welcome, welcome. Hello and welcome. Hello. Hello and welcome, welcome. Connecting a higher quality source did improve things, with the sample being much cleaner. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, 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 hello. The included tape comes complete with a selection of pre-built samples for you. These include things like a synth sound. Glass shattering. and a cowbell. Later on in the tape, so I discovered later, were various sound tools. These offered things like echo, reverb and bubbleizer. To use them, you first connect the microphone, or another sound source, and then the cheetah sampler converts them in real time and adds the effect you've chosen. Hello, this is a real time echo generator. Some of them are quite good for an 8-bit computer, with a 17.5 kHz sampler bolted onto it. And this is the demonstration of one of the real-time sound tools you get with the Cheetah Sound Sampler. It's called the Bubbleizer. Let's have a listen to some more. This is the voice shooter. You can make changes to the parameters by using the keys. Not really sure what they do because I haven't got a manual. You can get you all the peculiar As a piece of hardware then, it's quite good. And as you would expect, it beats any software offerings. It's a pity that there's no manual, at least there wasn't in mine, and I couldn't find one on the internet. To sum up, for its time, a fine sampler, limited only by the Spectrum's memory. This is Total Recall, released by Ocean Software in 1991. It's obviously a game based on the film of the same name, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Originally planned for release in December 1990, the game was not thought to be good enough, and here we can see the early version. Ocean did not like it, and changed the development team, and shortly after, according to James Higgins in the excellent Ocean History book, a complete rewrite was knocked together in about three and a half weeks. This new version was improved in every way. You play Quaid, a man whose life is a mystery, a man who had a mind implant to hide his identity, and now he wants to find out about himself. The first level sees you trying to get him from his hotel to a phone box on the other side of the city, avoiding people who want to kill him.
There are various buttons that when operated create bridges or open pathways and these are the key to the game and you will have to work out which switch does what if you want to get very far. There are lifts that take Quaid to other levels too and weapons to collect and enemies to punch or shoot. During this level he has to collect five objects. These are things like a briefcase, passport and tickets to Mars. This level is large and with the addition of the extra tasks will take you a while to get through. That is if you can stay alive long enough. I found it quite tricky to get very far on this level but I did enjoy playing the game nevertheless. The graphics as mentioned before are excellent, they're well drawn and well animated and the use of colour is very clever too and the backgrounds have some wonderful detail. Sound is used very well and there's some great music on the title screen and some nice effects used for things like switches or lifts. I never managed to get beyond this level, but watching the RZX playback, the next level consists of a driving section where you have to locate a warehouse while avoiding other vehicles. This part is very reminiscent of a horizontal version of Spy Hunter. Once past this, it's back to the platforms again, where you have to escape and get to the spaceport, ready for the trip to Mars. Once on Mars you have to locate the Rebel hideout, and this sees us back in the driving sections again. Once past this, it's on to the last level, and the search for the Rebel leader. And here we're back on the platforms and switches variant. This game is large and it will not be completed quickly, so you do get value for money. A great game then, with large graphics and good gameplay. Certainly give this one a try if you're a good gamer. This is Transmuter, released by Codemasters in 1987. The planet is dying and humans have burrowed deep into the core to survive, leaving mechanical security devices to fend off any potential invaders. As time goes on though, the planet can no longer sustain life and the humans leave. However, after leaving, this leaves the planet full of deadly defence systems that must be destroyed to protect any space travellers that happen to find the planet and want to go exploring. And so starts this horizontal shoot 'em up. You control the transmuter ship on a mission to destroy everything. Typically there are ground based targets, flying aliens, missiles and of course the cave roof and the ground to watch out for. Level 1 and we get a smooth scrolling landscape but only in two colours. Various aliens pop up and it's just a matter of destroying them. When enough are shot, you can upgrade your ship. Icons at the bottom of the screen indicate what can be selected, and these range from faster movement, double shots, lasers and shields. I found the laser to be most effective, as a first choice, if you can stay alive that long. The ship wobbles its head for some reason, and it looks a bit strange. It would have been better just to leave it static in my opinion. If you complete this level, you get an end of level boss. And here you just have to destroy the various shields in front of it before taking a shot directly at its centre.
Once past this, there's a quick bonus level. And then it's on to a whole new section that reminds me of Penetrator, but without any shooting. And this section is really just a test of flying skills. Once past this, and the game introduces shootable scenery, where you have to blast your way through various things, and at the same time, avoiding the gun turrets. And this can be pretty tricky, because sometimes they're hidden behind the scenery, and it's hard to see them. Again we get an end of level boss, which is just the same as the level 1 boss. And then the game loops to the start again, adding more things to avoid and shoot. The graphics are okay, they're well defined and animated quite well, apart from the wobbly headed ship. Sound is a bit of a letdown. Apart from the explosions and the laser fire, there's very little of it, which is a bit disappointing really. And especially in the penetrator light sections, you'll find that the game runs in silence. Overall, not a bad shooter. It's quite easy to pick up and get used to, and for an average gamer, you can get quite far. Certainly give this one a try if you like shoot 'em ups. When The Hobbit was released in 1983, the gaming world thought it was revolutionary. It broke the mould of adventure games and introduced new concepts. Not only did it employ great graphics for many of its locations, but the artificial intelligence of the other characters astounded game players. The complex parser meant that you could talk to the game in English, which sometimes led to strange goings on in the land of Middle Earth. This 48k game was heralded as the best thing to happen to the Spectrum and especially those players who loved getting knee-deep in goblins, dragons and swordplay. But could it have been any better? In today's world where Sir Clive's machines have been turned inside and out, and of every secret documented and every last bit of power extracted from its tiny CPU, could modern techniques improve the game? There are two elements to look at, the game itself and the graphics. Due to the way it was written, and how the game text was compressed and squeezed into memory, the first option would be very tricky, but the second option proved too tempting for the community to resist. Using 128k instead of 48, and employing data compression techniques, a group of Spectrum users set about rebuilding all of the graphics for the game, and in some instances, using other computer versions where the original didn't have any. The result is a glorious reimagining of the game. Gone are the flat, single coloured filled images, replaced instead with some great artwork. The game plays exactly the same, but the new graphics make it shine like it never did before. Each location looks fresh and new, just like when you first played it. The community did a fantastic job of collating and drafting the images, and finally releasing the full 128k version. Despite some objections about certain pictures and, and usage of attributes, Kaemon made the final push and compiled everything together, and a fine job he's done as well. This then is a classic game made even better by the addition of great graphics, and it's highly recommended. Hello, and today we're going to take a look at The Wild Bunch. The Wild Bunch was released in 1984 by Firebird Software and was written by Kevin Smith. 
This is kind of another one of those strategy management type games that regular viewers to this section of the Spectrum show will know I'm a bit of a fan of. But this one is kind of the best of the ones I've gone through so far. It's strategy management plus plus. And the plus plus is the Wild West setting and the fact that you have other things to do. So as well as the usual what do I do type scenario where you've got to manage your resources, mainly money, you also get to gunfight, play poker with the town gambler and just generally have a good time in the Wild West. The backstory to this, which appears when you first load up the game and first start the game, is that you're framed for a murder you didn't commit. And the dying man tells you that it was the Wild Bunch, or a member of the Wild Bunch, that committed the murder. Now he doesn't give you the name of the member of the Wild Bunch that committed the murder, he just tells you their distinguishing feature. And each member of the Wild Bunch has one distinguishing feature. They're things like they have no left or right ear, they have no left or right eyebrow, they have a scar on one of their cheeks, they limp with one of their legs. And at the start of the game, you don't know which member of the Wild Bunch has which feature. You find this out by going to the Sheriff's Office and reading the Wanted posters. And once you've done that, you can make a list. The most important thing that you need while you're playing this game is a pen and paper. Or if you're playing it on an emulator, open up Notepad and just write down your notes. So write down the distinguishing feature of the member of the Wild Bunch you're after. And then for each member of the Wild Bunch, write down what their distinguishing feature is as you find it out. E.g. George Parkin might have a scar on his right cheek. Now one thing the game does do is that... When you see the wanted poster, you've got to remember that you're looking at it in a mirror, so to speak. So if the scar appears on the left-hand side of the face in the wanted poster, it's actually a scar on that gentleman's right cheek. I remember when I was young and first playing this game, that caught me out a few times. Now, I like this kind of game anyway. As I've said, people who've watched this series of hidden gems that I've been going through will know that I don't just like shoot em ups. I like shoot em ups, but I don't just like shoot em ups. I like different kind of games, and this kind of strategy, work your way through something game always appeals to me. This one, as I say, is plus plus. It's so good. The Wild West setting is absolutely brilliant. As a young boy, that Wild West setting appealed to me even more. I mean, there's there's only one thing that kids like more than cowboys and Indians, and that's space heroes. As very well demonstrated by the Toy Story series of films. Although I think the little boy goes back to Woody in the end anyway. Now the first thing I always do when I play this game is go and play poker with the town gambler. There's two reasons for that. One, I quite like the poker game anyway, and two, it's the best way to get a bit of money behind you to then buy things like a horse and a saddle, which makes the game a lot easier. If this game passed you by the first time, it's well worth seeking out. If you never played this, it's worth seeking out. The thing that I would say though is practice gunfighting. It's very, very easy to be having a good game and die in a gunfight. The only real difference I've ever found between level 1 and level 3 is that the gunfights take even longer and are a bit more twitchy. So that's the Wild Bunch. As I say, it's well worth seeking out. It's a superb game. If you like strategy games, then seek it out. If you like cowboy games, then seek it out. If you like cowboy strategy games like me, then definitely seek it out. And even if you played it back in the day, and haven't played it for quite a few years, get yourself an emulator. It's available on World of Spectrum, so download it and run it back up again. You'll find that unlike some games, it hasn't lost its charm after all these years. Until next time, happy gaming! Here it is, the final instalment of the Development Diary, and Jason has been rushing to get things done for this release. Despite some computer issues that nearly saw him lose the entire game, he finally pulled it all together. A problem with firing gave him some late nights too, that he just managed to sort out just a few days ago. There have been lots of changes since the last version. The speech has been added using the Kara micro speech, and this really gives the game an authentic feeling. Smart, 
The room transition now looks like the arcade too, as the rooms slide off with a nice sound effect. Evil Otto has had his code tweaked to make him move faster, but the time limit for him appearing has been extended to give the player a little bit more of a chance. And now, when he does appear, it really makes you panic and head for the exit. The movement of the player was causing concern, so he moved that into machine code to give it some extra speed. The death effects have been swapped from the normal beep to a sizzling sound, which is nice. Diagonal player movement has been added as well, and there are also changes to the robot positioning to avoid overwriting graphics at the start of each screen. There's also now an object to the game, you can escape, and to do this you have to reach the end room, and to get there you just follow the arrow at the bottom right of the screen. Although different from the arcade, I think this improves the gameplay, as you now have something to work towards. The code in general has been tidied up, reducing the overall footprint by about 50%, which is very impressive. The game now plays really well, and can be very challenging, especially on the later levels, and some rooms make it really tricky to get out of, without being caught by Evil Otto. Now it's complete, Jason will release the final version very shortly, and you can download it from my blog and give it a try yourself. I'd like to thank Jason for all his work over this last series, and for giving us a chance to watch the game being put together. In episode 44, I looked at Paintbox, an art package for the Spectrum. Although it fulfilled the basics, it could not compete with some of the better programs that came later, such as the OCP Art Studio. This program, released by Rainbird in 1985, was bundled with several peripherals, including various mice, and was also sold as a standalone product. The manual covers many features this tool has, so let's dive in and take a look. The screen displays a menu at the top, and a large mouse pointer. The print menu obviously allows printing if you have a printer attached. The file menu allows loading and saving. The attributes menu allows you to set ink and paper colours as well as border colours and other values. The paint menu allows you to select how you want to draw on screen with sub-options for things like brushes and pens. The miscellaneous section gives options to clear the screen or set the grid, which is useful when working with colours. The undo menu does what you would expect, but it only has one level, so it will only undo the last command. The windows menu allows you to define an area on screen and do various actions against it, such as copy and paste, invert, rotate or scale. Very powerful, and we'll look at this a bit later on. The fill menu gives you various fill options, along with sub-options for solid or textured fills. The magnify option allows you to magnify an area of screen to various levels, so you can work in detail. The text menu allows you to add text, and the shapes menu allows you to create various shapes or use line tools. So there's a lot of things at your disposal in this package, but it won't make you a good artist. You have to have some talent before you can create anything half decent, as we shall see. I created this line drawing so that you wouldn't get bored with me faffing about with the line tool, but let's jump in and start adding some textures. Before that though, I'm going to add a little bit more detail to one of the walls. So I select the magnify tool so I can work closer, pick an area on screen I want to magnify, and here we have it, a close-up view. I can now draw the little bit of detail that I'm looking for, which is going to be a sort of hole. When working in the zoomed area, you can move around using the sliders. And to paint, you just do what you'd expect. You hold the mouse button down, and it will set the ink. However, one little annoyance is that if you go over an existing pixel, it will decolour it, so you have to be quite accurate with the mouse. Once that's done, we can go add some more detail in preparation for the Windows tool. I'll just draw a sort of ring and now we can use one of the program's best features. If I wanted to create another version of the ring on the other wall, 
I simply go to the Windows menu, define a window, and put an outline around the area I want to use. I can then select Cut and Paste Window, I drag the area to the other side of the screen, and hey presto, I have another image on that side. I can now define that window and flip it and rotate it to make it fit in with the rest of the picture. With that done, let's start adding some textures. I'm going to set the background colour to black and the foreground colour to red, and we can go ahead and start putting them in. I know it's not the best picture in the world, but at least it will demonstrate some of the functions. Adding some textures, we'll set the darker ones at the back and lighter ones at the front to give some sort of depth feeling. I know I'm not using colour in this, but I haven't got time to start worrying about attributes, and I'm only trying to show you what the tool is capable of. Let's take a quick tour of the paint options. There are several pen types to choose from. The spray can gives different densities to use. The brushes again have set options, but you can edit these and create your own. The Windows tool is very powerful, as mentioned before. You can create something, copy it, enlarge it, rotate it, or merge it. The text options allow normal, double or triple size letters. And you can even edit your own fonts, or load your own fonts in from another source. All in all, this is a very powerful tool, especially when used with a mouse. For any artist, this was a must-have for the Spectrum, and it's highly recommended if you are graphically inclined. Well, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.